All right, good morning, everyone, and thanks all of you who are who are joining us. And James and Marie, we get to do this together. So um, at, we're gonna get right into it. We don't have a ton of time, but we wanted to start with one small exercise that's an example of something you can do because a lot of working remotely um, and harnessing creativity, one of the ways I look at it is how do we use everything outside the frame? We're so used to being in the same physical space and we know that physical space actually impacts our ability to be created. This is why places like IDEO have done amazing work on how you design spaces. So I'm gonna hold up a prompt and it's also gonna be handed out on Twitter. So those of you following along at home, I've just pulled a card from a game that I co-designed called We See. And I've asked James and Marie to find something in their visible environment that matches this somehow in some way. So we did pre-do this so they, we'd save time, but go ahead and tweet your own image to match this. So James, what did you pull as your match? Just hold your phone up. What, what did you do? Okay, so I hope that you can see that. Um, I, have two, I have two ceramic mugs on my desk just beside my computer and uh, the shape of the, of the item seemed to match what you posted really, really well. So I was uh, it just right, right next to me on my desk. I love it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Marie, what about you? What about your match? So I had to go a little further afield. Um, this is for my daughter's bedroom. It's one of her dresses and the stripes were like exactly matching your stripe diameter so i was like this is my thing <laughs> so good so and this was a building in amsterdam near where i used to teach i love it so what's interesting about things like this right and this game actually started because i was working with a team and teaching with an international group and we were always pinging back and forth and it's interesting because in the time of covid one of the biggest questions i'm mapping is what's it like where you are I'm hearing that a lot. And this desire to know what's it like where you are actually gives us an opportunity to connect across our spaces and to harness everything else. So one of the things that I wanted to do is hear from both of you in the ways that you have been working. We know that there's a lot of different ways to be creative, quote unquote, and to work with remote teams, depending on whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. And I'm curious, in terms of where you've been surprised. What has been an example of one of the most surprising or successful creative results that directly has to do with being remote? I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe Marie, why don't you jump yeah. in? Tell, tell us. Yeah, I'd love to. So my background before I started working at Meta Lab was always sort of traditional agencies or in-house teams where we were physically co-located. And I had this preconceived idea that um, the optimal way for creatives to collaborate was to be in shared spaces because, you know, you have these opportunities for like organic discussion and critique. And I didn't believe there was like a digital equivalent to that thing that happens when you kind of look over on someone's monitor and see what they're working on. And so I guess the biggest surprise for me has been that when you work on a distributed team like MetaLab, um, you have this, you know, opportunity to ritualize sharing work in progress and one of the things we do is um, end of day updates so no matter what time zone what location you post what you've been working on and it's kind of um, like a forcing mechanism so it makes us share early and share often those are really strong principles for us I love and it. so i find myself kind of 15 years into my career and like creative collaboration is at its peak for me, um, we have lots of great tools as well, like uh, Miro and Figma, where we're like literally in the same artboard. And so it's like a pretty exciting time, I think, for collaboration. Amazing. I was going to ask about tools. So, and I, for the, for the folks who are joining us, we'll post some takeaways, but yeah, things like Miro are great. And it is really interesting to see the difference between when you're in there together and when you're in different spaces. Totally. James, what about you? Yeah, so I think one of the most surprising things for me is actually you kind of hit on it, Kaz, when you were um, kind of introducing the question is the, the different modes of working synchronously and asynchronously. And I think for me, like that's been really, really interesting to see on a distributed team. And, and kind of to dig into that a little bit deeper is I think when we're an agency and I've worked in-house before where you have these moments of collaboration and then you have these moments of individual work. But there's a lot of things that kind of fit in between those moments. There's, you know, working, walking from the whiteboard in the meeting room to your desk to do some deep work. And it's, it's not like those modes change really easily. But what I've noticed in working on a distributed team is there's kind of this binary way of working. There are these really deep 
pockets of collaboration that happen and especially for our team because we have people located all over the globe we have time zone differences to work with as well so sometimes our team only have like an hour or two each day to catch up so there are these moments that are that are on zoom that are in tools that marie talked about where we're we are collaborating really intensely but then there's this context shift in this mode shift of working where all of a sudden you are able to do really deep work and to refine your work. And what I've noticed that there was a really interesting kind of layer of create creativity or layering of creativity that comes with that, where some people, you know, when you're in collaborating richly, you're sparking ideas, you're, you're building off one another, you're validating one another's ideas, that then you can immediately switch and get down to that deep work and execute and refine. And then you come back and meet with your team and it happens again. And this is kind of like a daily cycle for us at, at, at Meadow Lab and, and the products that we build and the teams that we work with. And there's just some really amazing creativity that comes from that layering and the, the dual modes of, of working. Yeah, it's part of what I love about what you're saying too, and to, to bridge to the speaker we just had before with what Rachel was saying is knowing your people and knowing what their rhythms are and supporting that awareness of what works. Um, I realized I didn't show my match to the to the, the, the image, but this is my match. Um, I'm, coffee is always within reach for me. And so just sort of knowing what things are necessary for people to be participating. It sounds really silly to have it be coffee, but like I've got my routine. I, I know that I work really well solo when I'm doing thinking and strategy mm -hmm. work. It's very different than when I'm in this sort of collaborative popcorn mode. I also think just in listening to you, I wonder for both of you, I mean, I, Marie, I don't have much visual for, for your context. We chatted with James the other day there, but like, I feel like I have a virtual bookstore in my apartment. And so very often, one of the things when I'm working with creative teams is inviting people to bring that stuff into the discussion. Mm -hmm. Like we've now got this multiplied reference library, whether it's a kid's toy or something else to help um, illuminate what we're doing as opposed to all of us being in a conference room. So actually we have an opportunity to use all kinds of different things. Does that come up for you guys? And tell us just a tiny bit about the size of your teams. You said different time zones. Yeah, that absolutely rings true for us. Um, in terms of our team size, uh, what are we doing? 60 on the creative team? Nearing yeah, that anyway. Just a little bit 60, yeah. Yeah, um, we have some clusters of folks that are in Vancouver and Victoria and Pacific Northwest, um, but we also have like a pretty large contingent that's distributed. So as far away as South Africa and Sweden and, uh, okay. you know, it's, really important like you i love what you're bringing up about backgrounds because often um what you know helps prompt the culture of our team is discussion about what's going on like oh my gosh it's snowing in sweden like tell me about that or yeah um you know especially during the time of covid we're often seeing each other's pets and children and it's just yeah. you're seeing the whole human uh, yes. which is a real gift actually that's one of my top takeaways is be human. Let it, you know, maybe yeah. wear pants, you know, let's maintain some appropriateness, yeah. <laughs> but be human, right? Um, so I, I, we have about five minutes left and I wanna, before we take a few questions, I do wanna ask one quick thing though, um, which is of course the pitfalls of this, just as a word of warning, there's so much to be learned. So I'm curious, what have you learned through your trial and error on what not to do with remote work? Like what are the must do's to make sure you can pull it off? So maybe just like a minute and a half each. Sure, I can jump in really quickly. So I think for me, it's all about like leveling the playing field. And I've worked with teams before where some folks have been uh, remote and some folks have been co-located and that's how things work at MetaLab as well. We have two offices um, where people are co-located, but uh, a lot of the team is, is distributed. And uh, in the past at agencies I've worked with and teams I've worked with, remote folks have felt like second class citizens. They're the ones that miss out uh, on speaking up because they can't unmute themselves in enough time or they can't see the whiteboard if people are in the room together. So one thing that uh, has you know really come up for me is the feeling of isolation that those folks have um, and not feeling part of the team or the conversation or, or the project and task at hand. So one thing that we try and do uh, really hard at Metal Lab is, is level the playing field and actually have those remote folks feel like first class citizens. Um, we actually build our culture almost remote first in a way to take care of the people and put ourselves in the people's shoes that are remote. So some things we do are, even if people are co-located in an office, 
um, and we are working with remote folks, making sure that everyone jumps on their own computer for a Zoom call, even if they are sitting next to each other. We use tools like Marie said that allow everyone to get in and, and be involved, even if they are in different parts of the world and have laggy internet or something like that. Um, and then we do make sure, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, that everyone has a chance to speak on the call. Um, I think this is Rachel in, in her last talk, that like a speaker's list is really important to make sure that everyone has the ability to be part of the conversation. So really kind of treating, treating remote folks like first class citizens is, is really important. Yeah. And a great byproduct of that is if you di design with remote first, it typically makes the in-person work better. So there's not really yeah. harm in that either, right? Those practices. Marie, what about you? What's a, what's a must do? Yeah, so pitfalls, a personal learning for me is, you know, when you work on a distributed team, you have to check in more frequently. Um, I think this is, you know, it's easy to miss some of the nonverbal cues. Um, for me personally, when I'm, you know, struggling, one of my tells is like these big deep sighs, you know, <laughs> like, oh. um, you miss that on Slack and you even miss that on Zoom sometimes when I'm like a tiny muted Zoom thumbnail, you're not going to get that. And so one of the things I've learned and it's a, you know, really important to me now is checking in frequently and explicitly um, to make sure I know how folks are doing. Uh, yeah, that's been one of my biggest takeaways. Yeah, it's a great one. And I would, I would add to that before we do some really quick takeaways. I'm watching Jane's face. I know how much time we have. Um, is, is on the note of both checking in and remote work, especially when you're juggling um, distances. You mentioned laggy connectivity, James. You know, we do have differences in digital access as well as English as a second language. Yeah. So if you're using English as a first language and you're working with remote teams, and even if English is your first language, not everyone is as comfortable with written language. So so the same thing as the equivalent of a sigh, we may find that for some people, suddenly shifting to primarily written communications can be challenging. So even that, having these kinds of check-ins, paying attention to what modes you're using, hopping on a call, whatever that is, I've found that that's really helpful too, because people will sometimes say different things than they would put in writing. So I just really quick, we're just going to list them off and then we'll take questions. Um, we'll elaborate later, but top three takeaways, James, for creativity at a distance. Okay. Uh, first one for me is make time for non-work talk. Uh, yep. The second one is embracing flexible schedules. So like your schedules and the people that you're working with. Um, and the other one is experimenting with tools. There's no one size fits all tool for remote work. So try out countless numbers of them, break them, stretch them. Uh, and you're, you might figure out something that works for your team. Great. Thank you. Marie, what about you? Okay. My top three. So the first one is remote rituals. It's important to creative teams, but really any team. Uh, we have a cool one at MetaLab. It's actually happening right now. We have um, GIF Friday. So right now, everyone on our creative team is posting a GIF with no comment, no text that just reflects how their week went. Um, so it's creating those little, those little moments, super important. Um, the second one is the power of asynchronous collaboration. Um, so kind of ditching that idea that you have to be in a room to brainstorm and embracing that like ping pong thing, which is, by the way, super great for introverts, you know, yeah. <laughs> some time to process and to contribute in an equal way. And my final one is um, flexibility unlocks creative, um, creative autonomy. And so what I mean by that is uh, it's kind of like a, a handrails versus guardrails approach. So in, our end of day updates, for example, folks are free to, you know, if they want to drop a Loom video, if they want to leave a physical sketch, if they want to leave a prototype or a screen cap, it's really up to them. So if you set the structure, but then leave folks room to express themselves in the way that feels most natural, that's a top tip. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And mine are really short. Be human. Be who you are. It makes the work richer. Know what you need to make it work and have it within arm's length and summarize next steps in writing because people hear different yeah. things when they're stressed out. It's always helpful to have some capture. And with that, Jane, what question would you like to take as you've been scanning the chat? Yeah, I, I think a really great one here from Amanda. So what advice do you have for priming team members who are lawyers and social workers and not used to being creative or feeling the weight of this moment differently than designers? How do we level the playing field on creativity as a practice? Oh, that's a great one. Well, I, I can share something, which is that, you know, oftentimes we're working with clients who aren't necessarily like creative practitioners. And so we have to do some work to make sure, you know, get rid of some of those feelings like, oh, I don't, I'm not creative. I'm, you know, a CTO or whatever. <laughs> so we do a lot to just kind of, um, you know, allow that, like everyone is creative. You're going to have a perspective to share. Don't worry about the quality of your drawings, but please like participate with us. <laughs> 
Yeah, totally. We actually have a few exercises as well that we run. Like Marie said, a lot of the stakeholders that we work with aren't necessarily creatively minded or don't come from uh, typically kind of creative industries. So there are some tools and we can probably post some, some after uh, in, in the thread here of the chat that actually help kind of break down the barriers between folks that are more you know, traditionally creative and, and, and those that aren't. And a lot of those are uh, ideation practices, games that help. And a lot of it is about kind of just like actually breaking down boundaries and opening up communication for people. So even the game that we played with Kaz earlier on, it broke the ice, mm -hmm. it got us all laughing and, and smiling. So there are little techniques like that that actually can create. And, and it's, it's honestly, I think with remote conversation and remote meeting and remote creativity or anything, it's about creating that kind of open community platform for communication where people feel comfortable to voice their opinions and can feel like they can jump in and jump out. So there are some tools that I think no matter what industry you're in can help kind of break the ice and get down to those conversations. So we can definitely share some of those afterwards. Yeah. Well, what, I, yeah, what I'd love great. to do, Jane, I was going to say on that note to speak to it, to wrap this up, um, I'd love to close with something that goes right to the heart of this and that idea of the mindsets that we bring to both remote work, but also are we creative? So I know I can't see you all, but everyone on the phone, if you would please point to the ceiling, you're going to point as if your finger's a pencil, and I would like you to draw a clockwise circle on the ceiling. So as if your finger's a pencil, draw a clockwise circle. And now you're going to bend your elbow and keep drawing it. Bend your elbow and bring your hand down. Bring it all the way down and look down. Now what direction is it going? Hopefully for Don't some of you it's counterclockwise what <laughs> happened <laughs> we changed perspective we changed perspective and i love using yeah because I, I love seeing people do it yes this is your next party trick and you can do it remotely um but the point here really is we often don't have to change what we're doing but changing our perspective opens up so much potential and whether that's how you view your lawyers your social workers mm -hmm. everyone is creative and especially out of the office settings, we really do have a chance in being human with each other to bring in the more playful aspects of who we are and what we have to contribute. So thank you so much, Marie, James, Jane. Thank you, Nobel, for hosting this. I hope those of you who joined us, we will tweet out our takeaways, but thanks for playing. Thank, thank you, you so all much. so much. This was so, so lovely. I so appreciate you joining. I think it's such a great talk on how to like level that a little bit so that everyone feels comfortable around creativity and doesn't feel like we're all coming in at different um, abilities, but instead like hearing everyone think out loud and everyone try to pair their right photos together. I think such a nice opener and, and framing for this. So, so appreciated. Thanks everyone. Right. Bye.